Hey everyone, this is the final part for we created rules for a haunted house that shouldn't exist. If you missed the first two parts, they'll be linked in the top of the description. Thanks. All signs pointed to us getting inside the giant hamster wheel and running. It looked like we would have to break the fourth rule. Greg's illustration of the giant hamster running on its broken wheel through a city made us think that we had to do something like that ourselves. Well, the running part. The broken part made us think that we were meant to break a rule. When it came to the white elephant, Jennifer mentioned something that she had learned in a university literature class from some Hemingway story. Something symbolic about a white elephant being a gift from kings to people that they didn't like. A white elephant was a costly gift to maintain, and it was so revered that you couldn't put it to work to get your money back. It was a gift you didn't want. Patrick thought that maybe it was related to Greg's hamster and the hospital bills his aunt had to pay after her bike got infected. Greg's sporadic mumblings while taking notes helped us to the conclusion that the glittering orb made of old bottle caps was related to a favorite saying of his when younger. One person's trash is another's treasure. Apparently, it was even an expression he reminded himself of nowadays when helping design advertisements. As for the salt, once we had tried a little on the smooth surface of the inside of the wheel and ran our hands over it, it seemed like it would not give us a whole lot more traction when running inside. Then I remembered something that I had heard about how salt might keep out ghosts and demons, and I said as much to the others. And we got ready to sweep it up using the broom and dustpan. Figured we would put it in front of the room's opening. If those entities ran towards us once we had broke rule number four, once we got to running inside the wheel, maybe that salt on the floor would stop them. For a while, Greg had been pretty silent mostly only jotting down and drawing things in his new sketchbook. But then, he had a whole lot to say. Gal and guys, Greg said. I've done a fair amount of research on matters concerning ghosts and demons. I thought that it would help with my doodles. Back when I gave a hoot and wasn't a slave to the corporate system. Salt doesn't always work. And we don't know if the entities we have fall under those categories. And besides... We should take a moment to consider something important. You know how we were vague with some items in the house when we put them into the design as kids? And how we think the house might be filling in the missing details? Well, we left the puzzles vague. I think it wants us to get into the wheel and run. I think it's using the cell to trick us into doing that. But we came up with the clues, Jennifer said, including the salt. Well, oh, sure, but that's why the clues all fit, Greg said. Whether it's a piece we literally use to solve a puzzle, or just a hint at its solution. We did plan on each floor puzzle relating to one of us. That's why one person took care of the items in each puzzle room, instead of us all handling them together. But at that time, I think it was rather random. We didn't know how they would all fit together. We weren't sure about the puzzles or didn't want to do them yet. That's right, Patrick said. And those items, at least for me, were placeholders. I remember thinking that once I figured out what my puzzle would be, that I would come back to it, change some of the things in the room to be more clue-like. But we didn't get to come back to it, Greg said. We considered the house finished with the puzzles still nothing more than the things around them with arrows or circles and the word puzzle pointing at where it would be. No, I said. We didn't finish. The house was complete but not finished. There are some things that we could have made better. We gave up. About the time that we gave up on Sally coming back. Whatever the case, Greg said, I'm pretty sure the house has been using what we put in each puzzle room to make up the puzzles for us. Maybe it's somehow tapping into our memories or subconscious to do that. Or maybe it's just using what's in the house. I don't know. Either way, it just wants us to fail. If we put that salt down in front of the entrance, 
thinking that the entities won't pass beyond it, and one of us gets into the wheel and runs. I believe we would be doing exactly what it wants. We haven't seen these things run yet. I don't think we want to. We should exhaust all of our other options at first. Going back to the drawing board, which for Greg was back to his sketchbook note taking, we returned to ways of making the wheel spin without any of us running inside. That was a doozy, because we couldn't get it to budge from the outside. Even when gripping the bands that ran at about six feet intervals along the interior, somebody said something about the wheel needing a person's weight in there for it to spin. About how, if somebody just got in there, it would unlock the wheel's movement, and the others of us might be able to spin it from the outside while the other person was inside. The force of the spin could keep them in place. They wouldn't need to run. We had our concerns, though. What if the person inside lost their footing, or the people outside had made a mistake, and the person inside accidentally started to run? That's about when we remembered that the white elephant statue, when we had tried to move it, had seemed to weigh about as much as a person. The white elephant statue might not be so useless or burdensome after all. We hauled it and set it down beside the giant hamster wheel. And let's hope it's worth its weight, Jennifer said, and she gave it a little pat. I had an idea from something that I had seen another guy do in construction. After discussing it, we turned that treasure back into trash. We broke these sparkling globe of bottle caps. We swept up these salt into the dustpan and put it down inside the wheel where we would place the elephant. Then, similar to a kind of trick I had seen as someone in construction who did not have their tools on hand, used to hold something in place temporarily. We put the bottle caps in among the salt. We faced some up and some down. Neither the teeth at the bottom of the bottle caps nor the salt were ideal for holding anything in place, much less the smooth wheel's interior to the relatively smooth bottoms of the elephant statue's feet. But if we used the salt in the toothy bottle caps in conjunction for a slight grip for when we got the wheel going, the force of its spin when we spun it faster might then be enough to keep the elephant statue in place. We used the broom for something other than just sweeping. We put it inside the little loop of the elephant's trunk. Our thinking was that the broom handle could function as a long handle that we could all grab. Then we took a deep breath and did our little counting thing that by now had become a ritual and together lifted the heavy elephant statue up and placed it onto the wheel. Something clicked. We didn't waste any time. If we waited too long after that click, we might fail the puzzle. Maybe we had already failed. There was enough space on the broom handle extending from the elephant's trunk for each of us to put our hands on it. It took us a little bit to get our rhythm in sync, but together we got the wheel moving. We had to get it going fast to keep the elephant from dropping. Faster, a little salt sprayed out the sides. The bottle caps alternating, facing up and down, held. Faster, the wheel was spinning at a running pace, but for all we knew the puzzle hadn't been solved. No doors had opened for us, and my arms felt like they were being pulled out of their sockets. I imagined they would keep going, still gripped onto the broom handle once separated from my body, as the wheel was spun more and more frantically. I kept glancing at the crazed yet frightened cartoony face of the hamster in its giant wheel terrorizing the city and that illustration on the wall. The four of us and the white elephant statue got that wheel going so fast that I began to think it was a wonder it didn't break loose like the one in the illustration. And that's exactly what it did. When the wheel finally broke loose from its frame, Greg yelled out for us to let go. I suppose it was a little similar to how he had to let go of his pet hamster when he was a kid. Except, this physically hurt. Of course, the longer you held on, the more it would have hurt. The giant hamster wheel and the elephant in it slammed against the wall and toppled. I was surprised it didn't do so much as put a dent or a crack into the wall. We were all groaning and rubbing our shoulders, arms, and hands. We sat for a while. 
No sign of the entities or their footsteps, but we sat facing the room's entrance just in case. Where the wheel had been, a hole had opened up under its frame. As we started to feel better, we got up and peered down into the hole. It was slanted like a laundry chute, or like a pitch black water slide tube without the water. Well, I said, we solved the puzzle, so this should be pretty straightforward. We debated it for a little, but then decided to risk it. Nothing else had opened up for us, and we knew because of how we had designed this house in Greg's old sketchbooks, that the door back through the ballroom would be locked to us. Not that we were eager to go back through there anyway. As we were starting to play rock, paper, scissors to decide who would go first, Patrick said, in an even, almost monotone, Geronimo, and he disappeared down the chute. We waited for about a minute, then we called. When we didn't hear back, we decided to go down after him. We agreed to each wait about 30 seconds so as to avoid hitting each other. I went last. It was a long slide down in the darkness. I called out to the others as I went down it. No one replied back. I felt alone for the first time I had been in that house. And then I heard agonized shouts up ahead. I tried to slow myself as much as I could by applying pressure to my heels and putting my hands against the walls. It hurt, but not as much as hitting my friends would. I heard them calling up to me. Patrick had slammed into a wall down there and he was hurt. Moving my shoes to the side when I was really close, I avoided much of the impact with Jennifer in front of me. She grunted as both of us did our best to buffer the impact. I could see nothing. Probably the darkest place that I had been in. Flashlights might have come in handy. Maybe they were considered electronic by the house. But we could have at least used a candle or a gas lantern. Something. Patrick had checked ahead that the electricity was running to the house. We had banked on being able to use the house's lights that we had drawn in years ago. But we hadn't taken into account the secret puzzle corridors in between. By the way, that was something else that we hadn't put into the house. I'm not sure if we forgot, or if we hadn't done it yet because we never made the puzzles. As far as we knew, the house made those corridors for us. Down there in the dark, we were pretty sure Patrick had broken one of his legs. I guess we had all hoped that, due to some magic of the house, it would somehow deposit us from the slide or shoot down into the floor that we had been on above us. You know, paradoxes and everything. It seemed like the house like those. But instead, we just slid down and hit a wall. Hang on, there are some rungs above me protruding from the wall. I think we're meant to climb back up. Man, this hurts. I think you can climb, Pat, Greg said. Uh, maybe, he said. If I can use only my arms and my good leg. We could help you from below, Jennifer said. Just don't touch my right leg. I can't see it, Pat, Greg said. Can't see nothing. Well, I'll let you know with a scream. Speaking of screams, something was sliding down towards me. It was the last of the four of us. Guys, I began. We've got comp- Something slammed into me. Luckily, it struck my shoulders and the top of my back and not my head. Even so, pain went up and down me like my entire body had become a bad tooth. It took my mind off of the chemical burns on the back of my hand that had still been somewhat bothering me. Fingers or something like fingers got into my hair. I tried to twist around to see if I could get some leverage on whoever or whatever was behind me, but it kept me from getting a good handle on it. Go up, I said. There's something physical in here with us. It's grabbing me. Grunting through his own pain, Patrick started to climb up the rungs and Greg and Jennifer after him. I couldn't see them at all, but I heard them going up. I gave a warning in case it was a person like Sally in there with us. Told it to let go unless it wanted to get popped. And then I used all the strength that I had from that position to strike behind me with my hands and elbows. I had air. Dark, blank, dry, nothing. When I climbed up behind the others, 
I kept thinking that I felt something on my neck or back. I couldn't tell how much of that was the after effect of getting struck or my imagination. There was light above. Kept thinking something would grab my foot and yank me down, but it didn't. The ladder brought us back up to the fourth floor anteroom next to the stairs, where a panel on the floor had opened up. My pain after getting clobbered by whatever had been behind me was residing to a dull, tired throb. Patrick was hurt worse. However, he could stand and even walk on his foot, though he hobbled. It seemed to be an ankle sprain rather than a broken bone. Even so, we had to comfort him as he expressed his worries of being a dead weight. No, I might as well have turned back before. He said as Jennifer and I got in either side of him. I got the feeling that ain't the case, I said. You took one for the team, Pat, Greg said. If not for you, then somebody else probably would have gotten messed up. Someone had to go first. Hey, Jennifer said. We just have one more floor left. It was true. One more floor, and then the attic and whatever secrets it held. Secrets like the treasure. Propping Patrick up, we stood together facing the flight of stairs that would take us to the fifth floor. Together, we walked up the final flight of stairs to the fifth floor. We had not designed a way into the attic, which is one of the reasons I considered our designs unfinished. Years ago, sitting together in our parents' apartments, we had made the notation that the fifth floor puzzle room would take whoever solved the fifth puzzle directly to the attic. The attic was a treasure room as well as an attic after all, and we had intended it to make it very difficult to get there. As I've mentioned, if we thought that we might someday face this house, and that making it as difficult as we could back then would somehow help us get our friend Sally back, I don't think we ever stated it aloud as kids. Based on what we had seen so far as adults, we could only assume that the house would fill in the details as to how we would get from the puzzle room to the attic. Before the puzzle room and the attic though, there was the rest of the fifth floor that needed crossing. By the time that we got up the stairs and were walking through the fifth floor anteroom, Patrick seemed to have gotten better at hobbling on what we were hoping was just a bad ankle sprain. The expressions on his face, though, made me think that the pain was as bad or worse than it had been. In this anteroom, there were a series of photorealistic paintings that my mind kept telling me were real blown up photographs. The frames were gilded and elegant a stark contrast to the subject matter. These framed pictures were about the doll's head pots with plants in them on the front porch of the house. From left to right on one wall, they showed first a doll head being removed from its body, then it being sawed open with a saw, then filled with an actual brain, then filled the rest of the way with soil. The final two pictures showed a dead or dying plant something like a small tomato plant without its fruit, being transplanted to the doll head pot, and lastly, what looked like a dried, shriveled heart, being attached to a branch of the dead or dying plant with twine, as if the dried heart were some kind of makeshift fruit. In all of these pictures, the hands of whoever was doing these things were always out of view. That brain and heart, Patrick said, that wasn't our doing. Yeah, Greg said, not to mention how realistic it is. I guess I was a good enough doodler as a kid, but I couldn't have made anything approaching that level of realism in one of those old sketchbooks. Nobody could. It's like somebody really took pictures while putting one of those doll head pots out front together, Jennifer said, and then it took some liberties. My mouth had gotten very dry. I had to borrow Patrick's water bottle. Well, I said, Sally did like dolls and the creepier the better. Similar to other anterooms, I think we had put all of this stuff into prepare who was going through the house for what was beyond. We knew that what was on the fifth floor would be almost entirely Sally. Unlike the other floors, which we kind of shared, other than the puzzle room, we had ended up moving most of our ideas up to the fifth floor, the highest floor next to the attic after she had disappeared. We had done that to honor her. 
And by the way, the mannequins on a couple of the other floors had been her idea to begin with. She used to say, What are mannequins but grown-up dolls? The next room had some of Sally's creepiest doll ideas. Dolls sat on shelves with their heads completely turned around. Dolls were glued together into towers and pyramids. There was the decaying furniture so overrun with dilapidated dolls and doll parts that you couldn't tell where the furniture ended and the doll parts began. Doll heads were used as bowls, vases, and light coverings. Doll limbs were arranged in the floor in random, yet strangely esoteric patterns. The next bedroom was like this as well, but there was a human skeleton in the next bedroom. I nearly fell over and took Patrick with me. And Greg and I were supporting Patrick in his leg at this point, and we were taking shifts. The skull on that skeleton had been replaced by a doll's head. It had took us a few moments before we recall that this had been Sally and Greg's idea. However, any relief we had upon remembering was quickly replaced by even more terror. We had not colored anything in Greg's sketchbooks as kids. Any colors were all the house is doing. By now, we understood that it liked to fill in the details, often to dramatic effect. The eyes of the doll head on top of the skeleton were green. The hair was blonde, like Sally's. It's just messing with us, I said. Hey Patrick, you're a dead weight as you called it. Is there any coming in handy? I think I might have wandered a bit after seeing that skeleton if we weren't propping you up. Yes, Jennifer said. A trap should be next to that, between that skeleton and the front of the door. Some dolls sailed past us. My heart seemed like it was halfway out of my ribcage. Sharpened bones had zipped by, missing us by less than a foot. They had come from an inconspicuous recess in the wall like flying spears. Greg sauntered up next to the other three of us, who were trying to support Patrick and keep her own balance at the same time. You've got to spring every trap you can, Greg said. Treasure hunting 101, or haunted house trapezing 101. Not really sure. You're crazy, Jennifer said. Yeah, he said. Tell me that again when this is done and we're getting ready to leave. Greg had a decent point. Although the other puzzle rooms had secret passages that had led back to the anterooms and stairway after solving the puzzles, this time would probably be a little different because, presumably, we would be going up to the attic, and then coming down from the attic, if we survived. It looked like Greg had thrown some dolls onto the pressure-plated area for that particular trap. I kept getting mental images of somebody else's sharpened bones sticking out of my body. The next room was even worse by design. The stench of decay hit us as soon as the door was opened. This bedroom was furnished with an opulent nightstand, a mirror dresser, and a canopy bed with curtains. There was a horse riding paraphernalia decorating the walls and shelves, like an antique riding crop and riding helmet. Sally had loved horses, and when I used to think about what I had hoped had happened to her instead of what probably happened, I would imagine her having run away from the cramped spaces of our apartment complex to become a professional equestrian in some nice open place. Or maybe she had joined a circus where she did tricks with horses. But she had had a good family that she would have been running away from. Even though money had been tight for them, her parents had once paid for all of us to go horseback riding on a ranch together. That had been a whole lot of fun. Scary, but fun. I'd kept thinking I was going to fall off or get thrown from one of those large animals. Our guide had been aloof, but Sally had helped me through it. I think she had helped us all through it. That had been when she was 11 and the rest of us were only 9 and 10. By the time her 12th birthday had come, she was gone. I went over to the other side of the large, elaborate bedroom and tested the other door. Yep, I said, it's locked. We tried to prepare ourselves for what we, mostly Sally and a heaping of Greg, had decided would be in the canopy bed of this room. It was another something that we had to face to go further. We drew aside the curtains. Inside, a unicorn was lying on the bed. 
Its horn was broken and a good portion of its face was sloughed off to the bone. Flies and maggots had colonized both its surfaces and exposed interiors. It's okay, Patrick said. He stood up on his own without the two of us propping him up, though I could see him wince from the effort. It's dead. In its mucky mane were objects that had been braided in, beaded in jeweled trinkets, symbols made of woven vines and a silver key on a chain. It was the key that we needed. Somebody just had to reach over and unbraid the chain from the dead creature's hair. Jennifer and Greg had been supporting Patrick at the time, so I took it upon myself. I got a good breath, careful not to breathe through my nose. Steeled myself, and figured I would just dive right in. The condition that man was in, it seemed the hair might just pull away with the key. A large horse's eye opened. We all got back as the by all appearances riding unicorn carcass stood up in the bed and clomped down. On the bed where it had lain were pieces of hair and flesh that made an outline of its body. It galloped over to us, backed us into a corner. Its front hooves kept trying to clip us. Its green grime teeth chomped down inches from our faces. Its broken horn threatened a slower death than a sharper, whole horn could. One of us has got to run, Jennifer said, to distract it while the others get the key. We can't run, I said. Rule number four. Wouldn't do to have both the entities and that thing chasing us at the same time. We're gonna get ourselves killed if we don't do something, Patrick said. Then Patrick hollered at the unicorn. He couldn't stop his feet because of the injury, but I think he had been hoping to frighten it. My stomach sank as it put a hoof in Patrick's chest, and I thought that I'd heard something snap. At that point, we had been letting the wall support Patrick, but his body completely buckled to the floor. Patrick, Jennifer said. Patrick was crawling in a semicircle, face down and jerking. I'm gonna gouge that thing's eyes out, Greg said. As if understanding, the unicorn aimed its broken horn at Greg's face and then charged. Jennifer pulled Greg out of the way. The unicorn thumped the wall like a ram against a tree trunk. Then it walked back and got ready for another charge. The stench was crushing and everything was falling off of it. One of its eyes did seem about ready to fall out. Maybe if we could keep dodging, its body would fall apart on its own. Or maybe the unicorn would find a way to keep moving until we were dead. But that got me thinking about falling in horses. And it jogged loose a more specific memory from Sally. I had been riding on a horse behind hers on a trail near that ranch. And my saddle seemed like it was sliding over in my body too. And I was sure that I was about to fall. The up and down motion was giving me a thrashing at the same time. I had been trying to shout for help over the sound of hooves. As I alluded to before, our adult guide had been very attentive to us. But Sally had ridden her horse back to me. She got a hold of my reins and was able to slow my horse down. I told her that I was afraid and that I didn't want to go horse riding anymore and that I was ready to go home. She said something to the effect of, this horse doesn't want you to fall. It doesn't want you to get hurt. Relax, work with it, not against it. Your horse will help you to keep from falling. It comforted me and allowed me to enjoy the rest of that day. Recalling that also helped me remember more details of when Sally had put the unicorn into our designs of this house. She had not wanted to put any horses into it. She had not wanted them to be scary or dangerous. And Greg had pushed the issue though, because he kept emphasizing that the house needed that kind of stuff from her. The more she had said that she would never try to make them scary, the more that he had insisted. Eventually, she had compromised with this unicorn. Not a horse, but a mythical version of the horse. But if this zombie unicorn was true to Sally's wishes, I began to think maybe we weren't approaching it the right way. I got as calm as I could, which was very hard given the situation and I walked towards the unicorn. The unicorn had been charging again, but it slowed down like I had actually confused it. Jennifer and Greg were screaming at me. I can't speak for Sally, I told them. 
while being careful not to turn my back to the unicorn. But maybe she would say that it doesn't want us to get hurt. It's been hurt though. We should try to work with it. Slowly, I held out a hand. The unicorn snapped towards it, but it stopped. It snapped the peace offering. I sighed, knowing how unpleasant it would be without really knowing, and I ran a hand through its decomposing scalp. Hair and the solid stuff came away in my fingers. I worked my way up to the key and I worked the key loose. Greg and Jennifer were able to help Patrick up, who was breathing heavy and said he felt like somebody had taken a sledgehammer to his chest. All of us approached the unicorn and gave it some careful petting. Even Patrick, who needed assistance, seemed like Patrick was already recovering from getting hoofed in the chest. I was thinking to myself, I don't know what kind of diet or workout regimen he's on, but I've got to get myself on that. That guy was holding up quite well, all things considered. Sliding down a long chute into the wall, getting kicked in the chest by an undead unicorn. Tang. But back to that unicorn. It tried to follow us out of the door when we unlocked the room on the other side. Seemed that it was on its way to becoming our very own pet zombie unicorn. Jennifer said that Sally would have been proud of how I had handled it. I think that made Greg a little jealous. He didn't say as much, but I could tell. The key wouldn't leave the inside lock after we had unlocked it, so we figured we had to abandon the key when we shut the door. When the door locked again behind us, it was a more audible click than for the previous floor. We had the unicorn pawing at the door on the other side. This time, it wasn't a hallway but a railway. There was a cart, and there was a tacky plastic ghost dangling above it. You know, the cliched little thing that's like a sheet with two eyes and a round mouth cut into it. A round hat was on its head and a cane was in the folds of what constituted as a hand. A little light in the ghost flashed airy blue, and an electronic cheesy carnival vendor voice said, Step right up for the ride of your lives. So close, but so far if you're dead. Death can be a long, long journey. I should remind you, please keep your arms, legs, and heads on your body at all times. And then there was a ghoulish laughter. Again, more tacky than scary. We knew from our designs, though, that this tackiness was meant to throw the traverser of haunted houses off. To put them at ease and therefore make what came later even scarier and more dangerous. As I've been saying... We had been trying to make it as scary and dangerous as possible when we were kids, and this after all was the fifth floor. Only one person could get into the cart at a time. Maybe two kids could have fit, but we weren't kids anymore. It wasn't far that the cart had to go on that railway. It was about the same distance as the hallways directly below us, but we knew that it would go slowly, and that if you didn't get into that cart and if you tried to walk, you probably wouldn't make it very far. The larger blades would swing more quickly and randomly if you didn't get into that cart. That was how we had designed it anyway. There were little blades inside the cart itself and larger ones in the grooves of the walls. The ones inside the cart stuck out like porcupine's quills, forcing you to stand up, while the larger ones swung back and forth like pendulums, forcing you to duck down into the cart. If you ducked or stood at the wrong time, you might get yourself messed up pretty bad. The saving grace for the trap was that the blades operated on prime number 5 and below, 2, 3, and 5. Once you figured out the pattern, you could wait the correct number of seconds. The problem was, it was different each time, so the first person didn't have it any easier or harder than the next. Greg offered to go first. He got cut a little at first through his sock by one of the cart's extending and retracting quills, but that gave us a pretty big fright because he still had a long way to go. But at the end of the railway, he got out and shouted back to us that he was alright. I think his pattern had been 2 seconds and then the little cart blades at 5 seconds, and then the larger pendulum blades, and then repeat, or something like that. Or that might have been mine, I don't remember. As soon as Greg jumped out, the cart started coming back. Jennifer went through with some near misses but without getting caught. I still think that on most days she's got the best balance and agility out of the four of us by far. 
I waited for Patrick to go because I wanted to watch from behind, in case I could help from that angle in some way. We were most worried about him. Oddly, it was like getting knocked around woke something up in Patrick, because he seemed to do the best of us then, even with a sprained ankle and what we hoped was just a bruised chest. It wasn't pretty though. Patrick shouted about every time he stood up and was grunting in between. When I saw him afterwards, he was all snotty-nosed, bleary-eyed, and drenched in sweat. As for me, I got a cut a little in the beginning like Greg did. It was those quills in the cart that got me just like they got Greg. Threw my jeans in into the side of my calf as I was trying to stand. It probably would have been a whole lot worse if I had been wearing shorts. After those first cart blades disappeared though, I was able to duck down and con and learn the seconds for the pendulum blade. And then, I had a pretty good idea of my sequence. When I got through it, when all of us were through, we glanced over at each other's scrapes. Finding Greg and mine to be nothing worthy of stitches, we stopped to celebrate. And we gave ourselves a few cheers, figured that we deserved it. Patrick joked, and I hoped he was joking, that he might keel over and die later from internal injuries. But that he'll do all in his power to put that on hold until after we had gotten the treasure. The house had thrown nearly everything at us and so far we had survived. We had risked our lives. We felt that we could do it a few more times if we had to. We felt that we were readier than ever to see it through to the end. But the room after the railway, the final puzzle room, baffled us more than any other had. It baffled us through its simplicity. It was a bright room, white walls, white ceiling, and floor tiles. There was a medium-sized, round wooden table at the center of the room, where the puzzle should be. On top of the table was a little wooden tray with a slanted receptacle or nug. There was a silver key in the nug, and there was a wire running behind it and into the wall. We were as thorough as always, searching every square inch and crevice of that puzzle room, which was about the size of the fourth and third floor puzzle rooms. Here are the only clues we could see in that fifth floor puzzle room. A medium sized round wooden table in the center of the room where the puzzle should be. On top of this table there was a wooden tray with a slanted receptacle, kind of like a pocket or a nug. Upon closer inspection we found the receptacle to be about 3 inches wide and about 7 inches deep. A silver key that seemed to be lodged into the bottom of the inside of the tray's nook or receptacle. We had some concerns that removing this key would start the puzzle. A wire running from the receptacle tray's backside and into the wall opposite the room's entrance. A part of the wiring was frayed, almost broken, nearest to the back wall. The floor's wall and ceiling of the room were all white, combined with the brightness of the room's lighting. It made us feel as if we were difficult to tell exactly where the walls were. Those were all the clues. And we were having trouble not just because of how little there was in that room to go on, but because Sally wasn't with us. This had been Sally's puzzle. But what did any of this have to do with her? When we racked our brains. The only thing that I could think of that might relate to Sally to the stuff in this room was about puzzles in general. Just like the haunted house had been Sally's idea to begin with, having puzzles in our haunted house had been Sally's idea too. Hadn't it? And Ted and Sally said something about how puzzles, when it really came down to it, were nothing more or less than a collection of rules. About how once you discovered the secret of those rules, you would solve the puzzle. Jennifer and Patrick felt that I might be onto something. Greg wasn't so sure Sally had said those things. I was reminded again of that song in the second floor anteroom, played to us from an old gramophone about how memory isn't as sure as destiny. Despite how minimalist that room and its puzzle at first seemed to be, we spent a long time in there figuratively banging our heads against those bright walls. That silver key in the neck on the table, the white walls, the brightness of the room, the wire running from the nook's platform and into the wall. What did any of that have to do with Sally? We had a breakthrough when Jennifer made a certain observation, almost casually. 
It was one that did not seem to relate very much at first to the items in the puzzle realm. It related more to what I had brought up earlier, about Sally coming up with the idea of the puzzles being on each floor. Jennifer pointed out that all of the other puzzles had to do with rules. While it seemed to be the case that each puzzle was most connected to one of us, every puzzle also seemed like it was trying to get us to break one rule in particular as well. For the first floor puzzle, Jennifer said, which was related to me, we had to resist grabbing the treasure, which according to the seventh rule should be in the attic. Yeah, Patrick said, that's right. And with the puzzle that related to me on the second floor, we had to get around the rule about climbing the stairs. They looked at me. The one most related to me, I said, that would be the third floor puzzle. The fifth rule is about failing in solving the floor puzzles. We had to fail that one in order to succeed. Well, let's see, Greg said. My puzzle on the fourth floor nearly got us to violate the fourth rule about running. Huh, that's weird. Fourth floor puzzle. Fourth rule. That is weird, Jennifer said. I'm guessing the house did that intentionally. Seventh, sixth, fifth, and fourth rules. The rules are going in reverse. By now, when Jennifer was speaking a lot less casually, if there's a pattern here, the next puzzle should not only be about Sally, but also about the third rule. The one about depositing electronics in that cubbyhole near the house's entrance. Patrick stood up where he had been sitting. He had to steady himself against one of those white walls that made the room feel much larger than it was. He winced as he took some pressure off his bad ankle. He pointed. That wooden thing on the table, he said, with the wire running from it into the wall. That thing looks like it could be a charging station, doesn't it? We all stared at it for a moment. You know what, Jennifer said. You could be right. I think it's the silver key in there that's throwing us off, I said. If that's what it is, a charging station, or something that can plug into one of our phones. We talked about it for a bit. There was no way for us to know if it was a charging station without removing the silver key lodged into the bottom of its neck. If there was some kind of apparatus that plugged into a phone down there, it might have been under where the key was lodged. And then I remembered and brought up the key that had been braided into that rotting unicorn's mane. That key had been silver too, hadn't it? It had unlocked the unicorn's bedroom that we had been trapped inside with that creature. The room had locked behind us when we left. Maybe the silver key was meant to unlock it again, so that we could go back through that bedroom, go downstairs and get a cell phone. That made us a little more confident to remove the key, something that we had been reluctant to do for fear of triggering the puzzle before we were ready. That still left the question of how to get around breaking the rule about electronics. Maybe we should break the electronic phone, Patrick said. That could be what the frayed wire is telling us. So we go downstairs, get a phone and break it apart. And then we put it back together here and plug it in. Maybe we don't even need to break it. It could be as simple as taking out the battery. You really think that would work? Greg said. Does removing the battery of some other part from an electronic device so that it no longer functions makes it no longer an electronic device? That gave us some pause. And then I remembered something else. It probably wouldn't matter, I said. You would have to break another rule anyway. Remember the rule about solving each floor puzzle. In addition to what it says about succeeding and failing the puzzle, there's also something in there about not fleeing the puzzle. The entities might come after us anyway as soon as we leave the area. But didn't we leave the second floor puzzle room? Jennifer said to look again at some of the other rooms in that hallway on the second floor. Maybe it's considered fleeing once you leave the entire floor, Patrick said. Or once you leave the house, Greg said. Regardless, we can't stay in here forever. I don't know about you guys, but swinging on a rope upside down and getting my hand burned, climbing and sliding in fear and everything else has gotten me bushed. 
Patrick, no doubt, is feeling worse than I am. I think adrenaline has been propping us all up. I don't know how long that's going to last. I think one of us should go ahead and go down and get a cell phone, while we've still got some energy in our tanks. I volunteer myself. We should discuss it, Greg said, about who should go downstairs, if that's what we're going to do. Out of the four of us, I might be the best person with that unicorn. It would have been Sally, but she's not here. You worried about it attacking us again when we go back through, Patrick said. It's not that. I did my best to smile. I'm thinking about riding it. Naturally, my friends protested. Something along the lines of, I must have a death wish. But I reasoned with them about how that unicorn could help us. As long as I wasn't running myself, the entities would only be able to walk when they tried to get after me if I left the puzzle area for the cell phone. That's what I would be counting on anyway. I also wanted to see if I could count on that unicorn carrying me faster than I could walk. There was nothing in the rules about riding a horse or a unicorn at running speed. I more or less won them over about the idea, though we had to take a vote. Greg voted against it, and the majority ruled in favor. After we had what we had hoped was a working solution to the final puzzle, a puzzle that had gotten us thinking about the other puzzles in the house, and how the rules applied to them, I got myself ready mentally, or I tried to. The others patted me on the back, and gave me the whole, you've got this feel. Even Greg was warming up to the idea and cracking jokes about virgins and unicorns. I figured that I might not have this, but at any rate at least I would go down with a bang, riding on the back of a zombie unicorn until I was yanked off by the entities. And the others got ready too, in case I had to hurl the cell phone the final distance through the hallway. If I didn't put the cell phone in the cart, they'd have to quickly put it down in the nook, where we hoped there was something it could attach to where the key was lodged. The plan was to take out the battery right after. If that failed to get the entities off our backs, then I would take apart more of the phone, or just try to break it. Like we had before entering that house and before starting some of the puzzles, we did our whole counting thing, eyes open this time, and then I pulled the key out. It didn't take long for somebody to fish down into the bottom of the nook. There was a small hole where the key had been lodged. Inside it was a wire lead. It didn't look like any kind of wire head that we were used to though. Tiny symbols were engraved in the middle prong. You had to get really close to make them out. Gold was spiraling out of a treasure chest, a stairway, and more. Each symbol seemed to represent one of our previous puzzles. It may not have looked like something that would ordinarily be plugged into a cell phone, but it seemed the right size. And that along with those symbols made us more confident in the plan. Pocketing the silver key, I nodded to the others, and then I headed out of the room as quickly as I could without running. We still didn't know whether the puzzles were timed when started. Thankfully, the blade traps didn't activate when I took the railway car back. It wasn't something that I could relax about yet though, because I thought I'd probably have to face them again when returning to the puzzle room. The other silver key did work. It unlocked the unicorn's bedroom. When I went in, the unicorn was waiting for me a few feet from the entryway, like it had heard me coming back. I tried not to pay attention to the maggots and rotting flesh and the exposed inner parts. I also tried not to think about the unicorn pulverizing me with its hooves or that broken horn that it had. Well, hello again, Unitorn, I said. Alright if I call you Unitorn. You know, torn instead of corn because of how your body's all torn up. You get it? It stared at me with its huge, dark eyes. One of those eyes bulged and sagged it slightly more than the other. Its broken horn was lowered but I hope that was more in pacification than intent to strike. How about, um, Pete? I said. Maybe that's a little better. Pete, the unicorn. Pete, if you help us by giving me a little ride up and down the stairs, we'll do all that we can to get you out of this house. I promise. Sound like a deal? It neighed. 
shaking off jiggling white maggots and pieces of hair and flesh. Okay, I said. Maybe that means you understand. Or maybe that was a coincidence. Either way, I'm going to try to get on you in a moment. Please don't kill me. I approached the creature and gave it some pats which it tolerated. There may have been a saddle somewhere in that opulent bedroom, and one of the many fancy drawers of the nightstand or the mirror dresser. There might have been one in the closet. I didn't spend time searching for a saddle, however, because I didn't know how much time we had after removing that key, and because I wasn't sure how to properly saddle the horse or unicorn to begin with. I had also remembered something Sally had told me when we were kids. Something about riding a horse without a saddle. She had said that it was possible, that it would just get harder, that you had to really get a good grip on the horse's mane. I was hoping, with the state that the unicorn was in, that its mane would not completely pull away as I was riding. My hand on the unicorn's cold, damp back. I got ready to leap up onto it. I had no idea how successful I would be without using a stirrup for my feet. I figured I would have to do some climbing. But as I was tensing to jump, the unicorn surprisingly enough knelt down for me. Thanking Pete the unicorn while being bewildered that he had done that, I climbed on. And then he stood again and I gripped his mane. I could tell that some of the hairs were better attached than others. In any case, when I tried to get the unicorn to turn, I leaned with my body and used the grip of my legs rather than pulling on the mane. I'm not sure if that's the way you're supposed to do it, but like I said, I was worried about the rest of the hair coming out. That unicorn was barely hanging on, after all. As quickly as I could, I got a basic idea of how to use the pressure of my legs to ask the unicorn to change its speed. Some of that was remembering the horse riding that we had done with Sally all those years ago. It was strange how the unicorn responded as well as a trained horse would. Despite the unicorn working with me, already I was experiencing some pain while riding it, and it seemed like its bones were jabbing into me much more than a normal horse's would. I wondered if it could feel pain too, like the dead or dying plants in the front porridge. I figured it had never been alive to begin with. Either way, I had no wish to cause it any more harm than what it might already be suffering by simply existing. Pete the Unicorn and I had to get downstairs. We had to grab the cell phone and come back up, without getting nabbed by the entities. I wasn't sure whether they would harm the Unicorn. For that matter... I couldn't be sure if it would try to work with them and get me over to them as soon as they appeared. Speaking of the entities, they hadn't come after me yet, so maybe fleeing the puzzle was related to the floor or related to the entire house. I rode the unicorn over to the other of its bedroom doors, the one that didn't need a key. I leaned down and opened it. As I rode Pete into the first of the doll bedrooms, I was thankful that Greg had decided to spring that trap here earlier. I nevertheless kept our distance from that skeleton with that doll's head that had some of Sally's features. It wasn't long after we got to the stairs that the entities made an appearance. They were near the bottom and some of them were already on their way up. The smaller bodies where heads should be gazed up at me from where they reclined. I had something like an epiphany of dread of how those things might run despite the crooked limbs and the robes of the larger bodies. The smaller bodies fused to the top of them seemed much more efficiently structured and muscled. If they could somehow detach themselves from the larger bodies, they might move very fast, even faster than a person could. Maybe they would detach themselves once you started running. I didn't want to find out. But I had to risk galloping the unicorn to see if it fell under the same rules as us. There was no way I alone could dodge all of those entities, were there six or seven, while navigating these stairs at the same time. Here we go, Pete, I said. We gotta run past those things coming up the stairs. We've gotta get to the front door. I tried to use the pressure of my legs, as well as a hi for dramatic effect. 
The undead unicorn rocketed forward. My head snapped back. My hands, which had been shaking, nearly lost their grip. Pete went down the stairs so quickly that I barely had time to react to what was happening. On the third floor landing, a large, many-fingered hand reached out from the side, and it nearly snatched me off of Pete's back. I guess one entity had already been on the third floor landing, waiting for us. Most of the others were coming upstairs with their strange, methodical, dance-like rhythm. Neither they nor these smaller bodies fused to the top of them were running, so that was a relief. I didn't see Walt when I glanced above, though I hadn't broken the rule about going upstairs before solving a puzzle. I was pretty sure Walt the Stairman was up there somewhere watching, wedged it crazily into the top of the stairway with his crooked limbs. Walt's brethren were threat though. I felt a scream rising in my throat as I realized that there wasn't enough room to get around the entities on the stairs. We were going to have to go through them. I wasn't sure what they were made of. I wasn't sure how strong they were. If it came down to playing chicken, I don't know which side would be the larger car. But that unicorn skipped the last flight of stairs entirely. It lapped over the railing. I braced myself for impact. When we slammed down on the first floor, my teeth clanged together in my mouth, and I tasted blood. I've got a chipped tooth from that incident. But at the time, I was just thankful that we had made it beyond the entities, and I was more concerned that the impact would have devastating consequences for that rotting unicorn that I was riding. Pete held up though. I'm pretty sure that he lost some of his mass, but he held up. Pete trotted up to the front door. I leaned from the unicorn's back, wishing again I'd had the time and know-how to search for and put on a saddle. And I reached as far as I could into the cubbyhole, until I got my hand on a cell phone. I turned the unicorn around to find an entity just a few feet away. Its smaller body had completely unfurled on the mound where the larger body's head should be. The smaller body unveiled those blade-covered upper arms. Because the entities had only been walking upstairs, it made them closer to me now than if they had been running. The ones that had been in the rear of that procession were especially close. I figured that Pete couldn't pull the same magic twice, not while going upstairs. I figured we would have to clear those entities from the stairway. So, I tried leading them away by going away from the stairs. I rode Pete throughout the rooms of the first floor, and they did follow, but they did something weird. They all got into the parlor, the room next to the foyer and the stairs, and they would not move beyond it. It was the room with that clown etched into the top of a cabinet, and the Mona Lisa George Washington melted face portrait that had holes for eyes, that the six or seven entities had gathered there. I have trouble remembering even how many gathered in that parlor. Maybe it had something to do with the distortion of air around them, like foggy glass in a mirror. At the edges of the room, they did an obscene little dance with their crooked limbs. The smaller bodies on top of them joined in. It was as if a group of psychotic cultists combined the random stuff you see in a modern dance club with some kind of ceremonial waltz and then added a dash of their own esoteric flair. Reverent and irreverent at the same time. The crooked limbs of their larger bodies and the handless, bladed arms of their upper bodies didn't help make it any less unpleasant. At the culmination of that strange dance, they all turned in my direction and waited. I was outside of the parlor at this point, looking in from the kitchen. What could I do but ride the unicorn at a gallop through with the ring of them? That's what I did. I had to get back to my friends. If I had been a part of some ritual those entities had been doing in the parlor, I didn't want to think about it. I galloped Pete up the stairs into his bedroom. I gave him some pettings and assured him again that we would try the best to get him out. The entities, for all that I could tell, had no longer been chasing me. That weird dance of theirs had signaled the end of their pursuit after I had broken a couple of rules. I had no idea what it meant, but it did seem to tell a couple of things. One of which, they probably weren't dumb enough to have been led by me from these stairs without them realizing what I was doing. The others had their own motives beyond the rules that we had made that they were foreign to me, 
probably foreign to all of us. Had we created them, or had they been created by the house that we created? The entities themselves were one of those things like the finer details on many of the house's objects and like the puzzles that we had left vague. Like the house that seemed to be done with and had filled in those details. I suppose the house was filling in the details about the entities. But if the house had done so, it was almost like it had created something of its own. I thought maybe the house was making some kind of play at symbolism. The entities have those larger bodies with these smaller ones fused on. Like adulthood if fused to childhood or vice versa. I had no idea what it might be trying to accomplish in that, or what the house of the entities could want, beyond scaring and hurting whoever went inside. Those were two motives that we had worked into the house's designs when we were children. Having left the unicorn behind that bedroom, I went through the trap, the cart with the quills and the pendulum blades again. I was feeling alone at first, but soon though, I heard my friends be on the railway. After nearly getting my head sliced through by one of those pendulums, and then nearly getting hit again by some of those quills, I figured out the prime number sequence for my second trip in the cart. Even with some near misses, I got out without a scratch the second time. The red from the cut of my leg from the first time was still wet, a reminder of what could have happened or worse. My friends greeted me on the other side. I told them Pete the Unicorn. Yeah, we're calling him Pete now. No, he seems to like that name. He had done admirably, as well as any unicorn from myth might do. They asked me where the entities were. I told them about the ritualistic jig the entities had done in the parlor after I had gotten the cell phone and had tried to lead them away from the stairs. A real hold on at that. My friends weren't amused. They kept looking past me over their shoulders up at the ceiling in the corners of the hall in the puzzle room everywhere, as if the entities might ambush us at any moment. Maybe breaking two rules cancels those rules out, Patrick said. I don't think it's that simple, Greg said. It would be in the rules if it was that way. We didn't have much time to talk about it. We didn't know how much time we had after removing the silver key from the nook in the table. I went over and pulled up the wire lead and plugged it into the cell phone. I think it was Jennifer's, though I'm not certain if that really matters. The bright lights of the room flickered before going completely out. I think I had expected a little wooden attic stairway or something to snap free of the ceiling. You know, a typical way for people to access an attic. But when those bright lights shut completely off, a door slid across the entryway and put us in pitch blackness. Needless to say, it was a big contrast to the lighting earlier. And then the entire room began to move, like an elevator, except I didn't know if it was going up, down, left, or right. We didn't say anything, but all of us got closer to each other, and just as wordlessly, we all got back to back. We tensed up. I don't know who had started at first or if we had all started getting into that defensive arrangement at once. It reminded me in a way of the unstated reason why we had been trying to finish the haunted house as kids after Sally was gone. Without saying much, we all thought that it might help bring her back. If we had to deal with something else that the house threw at us, here or in the attic, something that we had not designed but that the house was, filling in the details for her, whatever it was, it would have to deal with the four of us. The fifth floor puzzle had been solved. As that entire puzzle room moved, we readied ourselves in darkness and silence, carrying the unspoken bonds of our childhood friendship as light. The attic and the treasure had to be next. The puzzle room stopped moving. The lights came back on. They were as dazzlingly bright as before. The cell phone was still in its place on the table, hooked into the charging station like device that had been activated to solve the fifth puzzle. Though the room had stopped moving, the door did not open. The cell phone rang. No number. Jennifer walked over, answered the call, then put it on speakerphone. The voice that came out of the phone was strange, different than I thought an ordinary human voice was capable of. It had a baroque quality, 
with additional sounds coming from the words themselves, like an ethereal growl of other noises, like static that spiraled outward with its own mysterious meanings. It was at once soothing, mystifying, and alarming. Congratulations, the voice on the phone said. No one has ever gotten this far. The others perished. But what less can be expected? You have created. You will create. You create. Nonetheless, congratulations are in order. You risk and you won. Now step forward and claim the treasure. The call on the phone ended and the door opened. That call shook us, but we were not to be deterred. Not this close to the treasure. We walked into a hallway that would have been dark if not for the spillover from the bright puzzle room. There was an old but solid looking wooden door at the end of the hallway. When Patrick put his hands on the doorknob and asked us if we were ready, it reminded me of when we had gotten ready to enter the front door of that house. But there was no knocker this time. No rules that we had to follow in order to enter. Patrick opened the door. We got a glimpse of a typical looking, medium sized attic lit by a single light bulb. It had stuff like dusty clothing piled high, broken TVs and other electronics, and an assortment of chests and other storage containers. Some red covered old Legos had spilled out of one of the plastic storage bins. Mannequins stood in the shadows, wearing dark clothing that made them more difficult to see. I knew that we had put some of that in the attic and our designs as kids, but I wasn't sure how much. There was a closet door that I didn't remember putting in. Towards the back of the attic, there was a long, coffin-sized chest that stood out. It was like an amalgamation of a coffin and a treasure chest. Its outside was etched and gilded like a treasure chest, with a touch of the gothic. It was like a treasure chest we might have imagined in any haunted house as kids. But on the other hand, it had the more somber dimensions of an expensive coffin. As with the puzzles, we had simply circled this particular area and our sketchbook designs had written in the word, treasure. For all we thought, we knew back then, the treasure could have been piled high in the attic outside of a container, like all that old clothing. That chest had no lock or place for a lock on it, but it did have latches. One of us unlatched it and together we pulled it open. Inside was a woman with long blonde hair, grown past her waist, hair that seemed like curls of gold in that light. Her facial features were a little different than I had expected, but more and more reminded me of Sally. She was very frail, her skin was intact and her body was moving up and down. She was breathing. Her eyelids twitched and began to open. Although she was right there in front of us, we called out to her as if she was on the other side of a river. It was Sally. The treasure had been our lost friend after all. The friend and fellow apartment brat that had vanished before her 12th birthday, assumed to be kidnapped or lost or having run away likely dead. But she wasn't dead. Sally was alive. At some point not long after we had opened the chest, Greg went up and closed it. And he closed the latches. He did all that with one hand, his other holding his sketchbook and his pencil together. When Greg stepped away, all we could do at first was gawk at him. The way that Greg stared back at us, his pencil in one hand and his sketchbook in the other. It recalled to me that strange look he had had on his face when we had said for the first time aloud that Sally could be the treasure. When we had said that here as adults on the first floor of this haunted house that we had imagined as kids. The little closet door in the attic opened. I heard it and had to turn my head to see. One thing after another came rushing out of the closet from a hunched position. The Frankenstein's monster that had parts of each of us, the butler mannequin, and the demon doll. As far as I could tell, modifications had been made to everything but the Frankenstein thing. They were more powerful and lifelike than the versions that we had seen before, and weirder. 
Instead of the butler just becoming a real man, for example, his skin was some fusion between real skin and the artificial skin of mannequins. As they left that closet, they sprinted past Greg and grabbed the other three of us. The demon doll was the same size as before, already having been life-sized, but not much stronger and sturdier than a doll would be. It came at me and wrestled me into a grip that I could not escape from. And it didn't help that I was exhausted from everything else in the house. Patrick and Jennifer suffered similarly with the Frankenstein thing and the butler. That Frankenstein's monster with parts of each of us was weeping and grinding its teeth behind Jennifer's neck while they gripped her around her body. It was weeping out of one eye that was Sally's and another that might have been Greg's. I did all I could to try and escape that demon's grip, but it was as if that surge of my strength worked against me, like it got gobbled up by the greater forest. I was being held by a strength that was as unreal as the Frankenstein thing's grip that we had had to contend with on the third floor, and it seemed like I could feel its sharp teeth and horns behind me, just from its breathing on my neck. It put my struggles to bed like an adult would do to a child. That made me angry, so I gritted my teeth and I tried once more. Again, it handled me like I was small. I expended so much energy that it began to feel like it was the demon that was keeping me from falling. Don't hurt my friends, Greg said. He opened his sketchbook, flipped through, and wrote something down. There, now you can't hurt them. Craig, Jennifer said as the Frankenstein thing wept and drooled on her shoulder while it held her. What's going on? Something that hurts me very much, Greg said. I never wanted to do it to Sally. He was tearing up almost as much as the Frankenstein thing. I'm sorry. I wish things hadn't gone the way they had. When I told Sally about my power and then they showed her, and she insisted that she tell all of you, even though I warned her, when all of that happened, I freaked out. I had to put her to sleep. While we were finishing the house, I was hoping that I would think of a way to make her forget. What are you talking about? Patrick said. Why did you have to put her to sleep? Because she knew. And she was going to tell the rest of you. And one or all of you might have told others. The power that I have makes me a threat to other people. It's my white elephant. The gift I never wanted. You remember what my aunt did to that hamster of mine because it was a threat to her. A harmless little thing like that. Now imagine what the rest of the world would do to someone that could make things real by drawing them. Once drawn, I can modify those things by making changes to the drawing or by making notations on them. You did all of this, I said. We did all of this. Greg said. Sally and I had a special bond, but the rest of you also mean a whole lot to me. I would never hurt you. This house might have hurt us, but it was important that I left in the dangers that we had all planned, and that I left some things for the house to fill in, as it tried to frighten or harm us. I was hoping that I could prove how much you mean to me. I risked my life here, just like the rest of you, and I didn't have to. I left the puzzles blank so that I wouldn't have the answers. Let the house make them, I thought. And I didn't have to do that either. You helped me create this. Anything you drew or wrote here, I went over with care and respect with my own pencil. We did this together. The house and its rules. They're ours. As Greg was talking, I realized something. Earlier in the house when Greg had been on stage with that puppet in the ballroom, I had flipped through Greg's new sketchbook. I hadn't realized it then, but I never saw the rules that he had supposedly written down from memory. Where are the old sketchbooks, Greg? I said. He gave me a pained smile. You've been asking that a lot, he said. I'm sorry that I had to lie to you before. Greg opened his new sketchbook and wrote something down, and then the book changed. It yellowed and became slightly withered. All of those old designs are here with me, with us, he said. Right after we had finished or completed, whatever you want to call it, 
our haunted house as kids, and some of us were beginning to move out of that apartment complex. I transcribed everything in smaller size, from those other sketchbooks to one. That was to simplify things, and to ensure that at the end of the day, everything was in my hand. I didn't want to risk something we had drawn into the previous sketchbooks, not taking root and becoming because I had forgotten to trace it over myself. I also wanted to create a sketchbook with my power to use as the sketchbook so that I had more control over it. This is the master sketchbook. Did you change anything that we created? I said. Yes, Greg said but I was as faithful to our original designs as I could be. You weren't faithful to us, Jennifer said. You deprived Sally of her life. I know, Greg said, and I'm sorry, but she's safe here. She's protected by the dangers and puzzles in this house. Dangers and puzzles that no one else could survive. And that's if they even made it to the house. This entire neighborhood is a farce. If you were to go into side the other houses, you would find them furnished, with the signs of people living there. But if you waited, no one would come home. I drew and annotated the neighborhood to be cut off from the rest of the world. And the only times that I opened it up, other than to visit it myself, was to feed the house with other people. Once opened and with the right enticements, mostly through online posts, some folk could come to get an experience that they would never forget. Whether or not they would actually forget, it doesn't matter. The house kills and eats them. You let other people die here, Patrick said. Worse, I said. He lured them here. I warned them, Greg said. I let them know that they would be risking their lives. I gave them the rules and all that. There is no fine print. The only things I didn't tell them was that my friends and I had designed the haunted house then that my power brought it to life. But they didn't know it was really haunted and really dangerous, Jennifer said. We didn't think it was real even when it showed up exactly as we had drawn it as kids. We thought it was a prank when it was put on. Greg, how many people have you led here to die? Look, Greg said, I know how it sounds, and it's as bad as it sounds. Probably worse when you get down to the finer details of me having to set up surveillance equipment outside and due to fully feeding this thing like it's some zoo animal. But there's no other way. Believe me, I've tried. Animals, corpses. I had to work my way up to live humans through trial and error. When I don't feed the house, it starts to fall apart and sadly gets sick. It might need live humans because of how we designed it to be both scary and dangerous. You could have changed that, Patrick said. You could have made it not scary and dangerous. You could have had it feed on flowers or sunshine or something. And Greg shook his head. It's not that easy. If you give someone godlike power without giving them godlike knowledge, they can't just make whatever changes they want willy nilly and hope the results won't be disastrous. What if Sally died because of some big change that I had made? And trust me, Altering the diet of this house wouldn't be a big change. I never wanted this power. I never asked for it. The only times I loved using it was when we had made this house together. I rarely use it these days, other than for maintenance, keeping Sally safe, and keeping my own head from being lobbed off by the rest of the human race. I'm glad you all haven't tried to tell me that you'll keep my secret if I just let you go. Sally tried to do that in the end. She changed her tune, said that she wouldn't tell anyone. Obviously, I knew that she was lying. And that hurt me worse because it made me feel like I was some kind of kidnapper or killer. It broke my heart. Whatever you plan on doing with us, I said, replan it and let all of us, including Sally, leave this house. You said earlier you told some friends that you would be here. Yeah, right. But I really told some people that I would be here. Now, those other friends of mine might not come rushing up at 3 a.m., but they'll begin to wonder why I haven't come back the next day. Did you not hear me, Greg said, about how this entire neighborhood is cut off from the world unless I want it to be open? 
The only reason I can think of that Patrick found it has to be because the neighborhood was open for the house's feeding session. Imagine that. What are the odds, right? I guess I'm to blame for making the access points somewhere in our hometown. But that made it easier for me to not have to travel far away when I have to go to the access points in person. Others who were not on the house's menu have driven through before. If they ever stopped at the house, they would never go inside. Unless they were the thriller paranormal seekers who found out about it online that I would purposely let inside the neighborhood. Only reason I made two access points is because I thought it would make them feel safer before they were eaten. And the only reason I opened the way in again for us after Patrick found it was because I had this idea. Well, it's an idea that I've had for a while, but one that's been sped up. After I've had to put Sally here when we were younger, by and by I began to think, wouldn't it be great if the rest of us could stay here with her? Greg, you need someone to talk to, Jennifer said. Someone outside of us. Your head's not in the right place, but anybody can get like that. It's not your fault. It has to be that power that's to blame. I need help, right? Greg said. No, I'm thinking very clearly and logically about my survival. About our survival. I don't need to stand here and tell you how nasty a place the rest of the world is. I don't need to tell you how we're given a set of rules all the time. That we're expected to follow while others are breaking them. Often at our own expense. The world is a nasty place. This house might be scary and dangerous. Hey, we designed it that way. But at least, rules mean something here. When the rest of the world falls apart, we could all be sleeping here, dreaming forever together. I haven't figured out yet how the neighborhood could open and close in its own accord to let others in when it has to feed. I don't yet know how it could monitor itself so that it won't be discovered in the wrong kind of way. But I'm working on those things. I'll be working on them as the rest of you sleep. I'll plan on having a solution by the time I'm old and gray and ready to join you, so that we can all dream forever. We could be immortal here. Sally got older, but I don't think she would ever really die in that chest. There are some other things about the house that I need to work on, like the liberties it sometimes takes. Filling in the details is one thing, but it wasn't me who put Sally's voice in there singing to us from the fourth floor ballroom. And I know that wasn't something we had planned when we were kids, and that I had gone over later with my own pencil. Also, I wasn't to blame for that. As Greg was giving more examples, a strange voice whispered to me, Get the sketchbook. It took a second or two for me to realize that it had been the demon that was holding me. I also just realized that its grip had relaxed. The annotations around my body in the sketchbook, the demon said. They did not state how long to hold you for. I didn't waste any time mentally debating whether or not to trust a demon. I didn't have time for that if I was going to stop Greg. It was one of those moments when you're completely exhausted, but that you tap into those reserves that you didn't even know were there. I was given an opening and I took it. To get around the rule about running, I bounded forward as quickly as possible. There was nothing in the rules about jumping. Greg had seen me and was fast at work in that sketchbook of his, but I was on him in two bounds. I tore the pencil out of his hand as he was so dry in writing, and I thrusted it into my own pocket. And then I punched him in the face harder than I thought that I could, given how tired I was. And Greg fell. I pulled the sketchbook out of his loosened hands. I'm not sure if that if I knocked him out or if it was what Patrick did next. Patrick dove on him and then proceeded to strike Greg while on top of him. Get off him, Patrick, Jennifer said, and give me a turn. I can't get up, Patrick said. I looked around for the Frankenstein thing, the demon, and the butler. They were gone. I suppose they had left the same way that they had gotten there, by that small attic closet. Or maybe they were on the way to Puzzle Room turned elevator. Guys, I said when I turned back around. We can't just kill him. <laughs> Why not? Patrick said. He took Sally's life away from her. Patrick was having trouble breathing. 
I couldn't tell whether Greg was still breathing. Sally's still alive, I said, and right now we need to help her. Yeah, Jennifer said. We should do that instead of killing Greg. I hauled Patrick up. Greg seemed to be unconscious but still breathing. Jennifer sighed as we stood over him. How can we just turn him over to the cops for kidnapping Sally? As soon as he gets his hands on something to write, I'm guessing that we'll all be in big trouble. The cops won't believe us if we try to tell them the truth. We might, we could just get them to believe us about the kidnapping part, but not about the other stuff. We've got to show them the house, I said. Until then, I think Greg should stay here, where Sally has been staying. I'm guessing the house pumps oxygen and nutrients into that chest that you said. I'm guessing. Let's get Sally, Jennifer said. We unlatched the chest again, opened it up. Sally's eyes had closed once more. It seemed something in the chest. Maybe some chemical or other agent being pumped in along with the oxygen. Put whoever was inside it asleep as soon as it was closed. When she opened her eyes again, it was like witnessing a miracle twice. Sally, I said. We're here for you, Patrick said. Well, get you going, Sally, Jennifer said. I don't know what you remember, but Greg... Is he here? Sally said weakly. Her face was very pale, but I couldn't tell if that was from mentioning Greg or from the state that she was in. She was frail, likely in no small part due to her muscles withering from all that time in the treasure chest. And to add to that, I wasn't sure how good the nutrients the house had been giving her were. Greg's out cold, I said. I had a jolt of fear, as I realized that none of us were paying attention to Greg at the moment. And then I turned around. He was still there. Still seemed to be unconscious. Thank goodness. But we were quick and careful to get Sally out. We put Greg back into the chest where Sally had been with last gentleness. And we closed the latches. None of us wanted to give him the chance to wake up and get a hold of a pencil and a sketchbook again. I took the sketchbook that Greg had been holding and put it in my waistband. As Greg had done when going through the house's crazier parts. I carried Sally who was very light. While Jennifer propped up Patrick. We went back to the puzzle room. When we took the cell phone out of the nook on the table and plugged it from the cord. The lights went on again. And the room moved back to the fifth floor. We did not have to experience the blade trap again in the fifth floor railway. As I mentioned, it doesn't activate when you're coming back. We spent some time with Pete the Unicorn, and during that time, Sally reached out for my arms to pet him. She said that we had to remove the unicorn from the house, that it didn't belong here and that it never had, and we had said how we had already determined to do so. I had promised to keep to that unicorn. But right then, we had to get her and Patrick to a hospital, and we would have to come back with a horse trailer or something. There was no way we could fit Pete in our car. As I carried Sally down the stairs while Jennifer helped Patrick, Sally was as light as a dream. She looked as tired as the rest of us felt, but she seemed none too eager to fall back asleep. And I don't blame her. From the cubbyhole near the front door, we got the rest of our cell phones and the keys that had electronics on them. Four of us had entered the haunted house that we had made up as kids. And four of us laughed. We had replaced Greg with Sally. It was about 5 a.m. and nearly 12 hours had passed since we had gone into that house. It had seemed like much longer. When we got into the car we had come in and drove straight to the nearest hospital. When we checked Sally and Patrick into the hospital, we had said they had been in the victims of a kidnapping and some traps that had been set by the kidnapper. That was basically true. At the time of this writing, a little over three weeks had passed since we went into that house and since Sally and Patrick were hospitalized. Patrick did have some broken ribs, but those are already healing up nicely. His other injuries are muscle related and should heal even more quickly. He's been out of the hospital for a while now. Sally's health issues are more complicated. She had been lying down and as far as we can tell, 
asleep for over 10 years in that house. Many of her health issues are similar to someone who has been in a coma for a long time. Her muscles and bones, for example, are so weak and atrophied that she has to work constantly with doctors and physical therapists to try to get them better. We're not sure if Phil will ever be completely better, and we don't know if she'll be able to walk again. We visit her all the time. She's missed a lot of time, but she's the same Sally that we knew. At least one of us is always there visiting when we can. Filling her in on the kind of things that she missed while she slept into adulthood. Sometimes it seems like she's the one visiting us when we see her. Like she's the one comforting us. She finds ways to make us laugh when we start to get sad about what she had experienced. And about what she didn't experience. She's able to find levity in the darkest of things. Even in her own captivity in a coffin like Jazz. It reminded me of how she had come up with the idea of designing a haunted house, probably to make us feel better about being so cooped up as apartment brats. It's unfortunate that her idea of an escape had a reaction with Greg's personality and power. In a way, it might have been a good thing that she had been asleep, as opposed to have her been awake the entire time in that chest. And the police reports have also been very complicated, Mainly because we were not able to find our way back to the neighborhood with the house in it. Jennifer and I even put pins down on our GPS as soon as we were leaving. So that we could come back and check on it directly after dropping Sally and Patrick off at the hospital. We were mostly concerned about somebody else going into that neighborhood. And for whatever reason, trying to get into that house. As far as we could tell, Greg had left the path into that neighborhood open even after we had walked inside the house. How else could we have gone out of it? But when we tried to go back, the neighborhood was gone. There were some woods in its place, and as much as we had searched those woods, we could not find the house. So, what were we supposed to tell the police without any evidence? The four of us agreed on what our story would be in the meantime. We figured that as long as Sally was telling the same story as us, we might look innocent of having anything to do with their disappearance all those years. But it seems that people are getting more and more suspicious. Our stories, while in sync, are too vague. And there's the matter of Greg, who disappeared in her place. Here is basically what we've been telling the authorities and Sally's loved ones alike. Jennifer, Patrick, Greg, and I all got an anonymous tip, a letter in the mail directing us to a house and promising us that our childhood friend Sally was there. The letter told us that we had to bring our letters to the house and burn them in a fireplace in order to see our friend. We had to come alone. We think this meshes decently with the general kinds of stuff we told others before going. And we did as the letter instructed, following step-by-step -step instructions to a house where we expected some to come out to meet us with further terms or outs and try to kill us. But when no one came out to do either after we had burned our letters, we decided to explore the house. We found traps, which is how we got cut and injured, and we found our childhood friend Sally in a comatose state. Greg, he disappeared while we were in that house. We had gotten separated at some point, and we don't know where he is. We can't give details about the kidnapper or kidnappers because we never saw them. At the time, we had been so concerned about getting Sally and Patrick to the hospital that we hadn't made the point of remembering the address. The location wasn't saved in our GPS either, because we had been going by step-by-step -step directions to the house. That's the kind of report that we've been giving. Obviously, there are some truths in there and also plenty of lies and omissions. We hope it will suffice until we can get back to that house and bring the police with us. Otherwise, they're not going to believe a word that we said. We set up our own hidden cameras outside where the road leading through the neighborhood should be. As we were doing so, we found a couple of Greg's secret cameras and took them out. Whereas, he had been trying to lead people into the neighborhood for the house to feed on. We were hoping to notice if and when the way that it opened up again. And we had four things in mind mainly. To prevent the house from feeding to get the police to go there with us, to get Greg into their hands with the promise that they won't let him anywhere near drawing or writing materials, 
and to get that unicorn out. We hoped to get the unicorn out before we went to the police, because we were pretty concerned about what might happen to that unicorn if the police knew about it. We'll probably never forgive Greg. We probably never should. But we mostly agree that he should not suffer the fate as Sally did all those years. Even though that would be one of the cases of the punishment fitting the crime. Patrick says to let him rot. I don't know for sure if the way to the house will ever open up again. Maybe the house is responsible for closing the path. Maybe it was something Greg had done before we had gotten him. Where you could go out of the neighborhood but you couldn't come back. It could also be that Greg somehow woke up, got out of that latch chest and closed the path off himself. We're constantly monitoring those cameras that we set up near where the neighborhood should be. When or if it opens up again, we'll be ready. But something happened recently that has led me to believe that it might not only have been us that left that house in its neighborhood. Two somethings if you can count the second incident. The first that happened was a couple of days ago. I've got a small house with some woods behind it, and my whole street has woods behind it. I tend to have a lot of backyard visitors, everything from stray cats to deer. When I heard something making a lot of racket on the back porch a little after 3am, my initial thought was, a big old cat looking for food, and had probably knocked something over. But then as I woke up and went over to the back door, I felt for sure it was a deer because it was too big. It started pawing at the door, so I got a rake from the garage and came back and I opened the door. It was Pete, the unicorn. I'm not sure how he got my address. Some animals are exceptionally good at tracking, but I can't say for sure about an animal that has never existed to begin with. However, it got to my house and I quickly brought it inside. I didn't want any of the neighbors to see when I think about what could happen to that unicorn, it reminds me of Greg and all those fears that he has of other people seeing him as a threat. That's kind of related to that hamster of his too, I guess. Whatever this world might have done to Greg before if they had learned about his power, now because of what he's done to us, and what he might do to others, things are going to be a whole lot worse for him when they find out. Is it crazy that I feel bad for him and hate him at the same time? But the unicorn is not Greg. I don't think that it would harm anyone, if it couldn't help it. Yeah, it broke some of Patrick's ribs, but I blame them more in the house and on Greg. With a better living situation, who knows? Is it living situation or unliving situation for something that's undead? I moved my truck and just about everything else out of my garage to make a spot for Pete. He has some hay and a little bit of space to move around until we can get a better location for him. I've told the others that he came to my house and is temporarily living in my garage. And Patrick and Jennifer have already been over to see for themselves. I think Sally wants to keep the unicorn herself once her health improves. And maybe we can pool our resources and find a secluded piece of land, somewhere for it to live on. I'm still trying to figure out what an undead unicorn eats. And for that matter... I don't know what a living unicorn might eat since, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any. I keep trying different kinds of horse food, but with no success. The other thing that happened more recently wasn't good. I'm not sure if it really happened or if it was my eyes and imagination playing tricks on me. Early this morning, I was out on my back porch eating breakfast, as I like to do. I had been thinking about what I was going to try to feed Pete next around and whether he needed some toys or something. When I saw the leaves on a nearby tree move in a way that spooked me. It was like something was in those leaves moving them, but also like something wasn't there. You know, invisible. I could have sworn that I saw a shape. It was tall, small up top and large on the bottom, and its outline reminded me of those entities. Then, whether it was due to a breeze or something actually in there, it moved away from the tree until I could no longer see that shape. I don't remember the wind blowing when it happened, but probably it was a breeze. Probably I'm just freaked out by the whole experience in that house. Having the unicorn show up on my back doorstep is one thing, but having the entities leave that house and seeking me out where I live, that's not going to work for me. 
I have still got some questions about the entities. Questions I mean to ask Greg when we go back and wake him up. Either way, it's got me thinking. If things like the unicorn are finding a way out of the house and the hidden neighborhood that it's in, we should be able to go back. In the meantime, we have Greg's a master sketchbook. It's the composite of all those sketchbooks that we had made as kids, but with Greg's changes and additions. Jennifer, Patrick, Sally, and I are still going through it. With it, we unearth new memories and mysteries just about every day. It's a lot different than going through the house in person, fearing for your life, when things are so frantic that you can barely think straight half the time. I don't know how we solve those puzzles. In the master sketchbook, we found the neighborhood and Greg had designed himself in order to hide the house. We tried erasing what we think is the closed off path, and it didn't work. And we also discovered an eighth rule in the master sketchbook. It was a rule that Greg had added to the other seven, one that he didn't tell us about. I can only think that after all that talk about risking his life along with the rest of us, it was some kind of protection that he had planned in case things went south with the entities. The eighth rule states that if two rules are broken at once, they cancel each other out. Patrick was right. It seems Greg was trying to shoot that idea down as being too simple in order to throw us off. I suppose that now I know why the entities stopped chasing me after I broke two rules at the same time while trying to solve the fifth puzzle. But that still does not explain that bizarre ritualistic dance the entities did in the parlor after I had broken them. I think there's a weird kind of loop or a cyclical symmetry to us imagining the house waiting there for us. Similar to how we imagined it years ago as children, but with real and recent memories pinning it down as vividly as anything else we have experienced. We'll continue to be vigilant and thorough with our camera monitoring and with Greg's master sketchbook. If the house has gotten control over the way into its neighborhood, Maybe due to some loophole or liberty that it is taken outside of Greg's designs, it can only wait for so long, with the path closed off, before it starts to get hungry.